We fall into this idea that the gospel is confess and believe so God can take you out of this evil world and take you to a better place. Come here to earth, kill all these people around us, purify it of evil, get rid of them all. And I think Christ weeps. If you can this morning, imagine if you were one of the disciples. You were born and raised in Galilee. This rabbi shows up and chooses you. He says, remember, you didn't choose me. I I chose you. And he chose you. And you begin to walk with him. Imagine the experiences of seeing him do his first miracle, turning water into wine. You see the lame walk, the dumb speak, the blind see. The dead raised to life, demons cast out, walks on water, breaks the bread. And you begin to believe this is the Messiah. Do you ever wonder what you would discuss among yourselves as a disciple? Guys, this is him. What's he going to do next? What's getting ready to happen here? Are are we going to be with him the rest of our lives? Is he going to send us out again? We weren't too prepared the last time. Maybe he's going to break us up two by two, and we're going to go all over the world. But something's changing. The tone's beginning to change. He's talking about heading to Jerusalem, and you understand this story because the text foretells it. The king is coming, going to take the throne, going to march into Jerusalem, establish the kingdom of David. He gathers you together and says, guys, it's time to go pack your bags. And now you're going, what do I pack? What do you pack for a Messiah entering Jerusalem? You grab your best cloak. You try to get the best shoes that you have. And you're remembering his teaching that sometimes don't take anything with you. And fortunately, you had just a few few dollars with you. and, And you had your knife. Because a Messiah is entering Jerusalem. But then there's something nagging you in the back of your mind. What is he going to do about Rome? How's he going to do that? It's one thing to raise one person from the dead. It's one thing to feed the 5,000. But what about the masses that are getting ready to send into this holy city for Passover? What about the legions of Roman soldiers, the thousands upon thousands of Roman soldiers guarding every gate, inspecting every visitor? What's he going to do about that? But again, the question comes back to you. Is it now that the kingdom of heaven will be restored to Israel? Is it now? It sounds like it is. You're walking towards Jerusalem. What discussion are you going to have? Where are we going to stay? What are we going to do? Two of you peel off, James and John, and corner this Messiah and says, Hey, when you enter into your kingdom, can we sit on the right and left of you? You overhear the discussions and are disappointed in yourself. Why didn't I think of that? He's marching into Jerusalem. He's probably going to move into Herod's palace. It's a beautiful place. We've seen it before. And I missed my opportunity to rule with him in his throne room. Thomas, and hearing some of this discussion about Jesus having to go to Jerusalem to die, he says, guys, let's get together. Let's go up with him to die. Over and over, the disciples are ready. Let's go. Rome We're going to take over the kingdom. March into Jerusalem, overthrow the government, and take the throne. I want us to jump back real quickly, and just so we understand the significance of this narrative. Escaping out of the bondage of Egypt, they spend time in the desert trying to understand the political structure of what God wants in this kingdom. It's a unique structure. There's priests, but no king. There's a holy of holies, but no emperor. And they're struggling to understand this, but then they begin to realize that we listen to God. His word tells us how to live our lives, and and we are supposed to be an example to the entire world. So the world floods in to the holy city, and they bless all nations. They struggle with it, and We see about 500 years after the Exodus, they they plead for a king like their neighbors. Make us a king like our neighbors. They get one, Saul. 
He's like their neighbors. David comes to power, and it's a man after God's own heart, but quickly his son Solomon now is reigning, and he has problems, gold, women, name it. His, it's a long list for him. And shortly after, now the kingdom is divided, ten tribes in the north and Judah in the south. In 722, Assyria comes in and conquers the northern kingdom, hauls them off into slavery. Judah hangs on all the way until 597, and Babylon now comes in and conquers the entire uh, city, cities of Judah and Jerusalem and hauls them off, and they hang their harps and weep and cry, how can we sing anymore? We've been hauled off into captivity. While they're there, they begin to think, what was the reasons why we've been hauled off into slavery? What is this cause of ours? And they remember the words of the prophet saying, if you would just obey my commands, if you would have kept my Sabbaths, you wouldn't have been hauled off. And they vow before God, never again will we go into slavery because of disobedience. The rabbinical movement started, the, the ability to get together and study the scriptures, and together they begin to research and study these words that they've heard. Persian Empire comes to power, and Nehemiah begins this journey back into Jerusalem. They don't even have the words of the, of the text anymore. They're searching for it, and they find one in the old, te- old temple, and they begin to study this new text again, searching for God, trying to understand his words. Most of the Jewish people stay back in Persia because Persia was a, a looser entity. They let the, the Jewish nation kind of have their own um, structure to, to a point, so they had no reason to come back from Persia into Jerusalem. And then by 332, Greece comes to power under Alexander the Great, and they march into Jerusalem and overthrow the government again. Israel again, once again, is under an authoritarian structure. A few hundred years later, something very unique happens. The Jewish people rise up and chase out their oppressor. While this is happening, they were trying to have a Sukkot, but during this battle, they couldn't. So they had the Sukkot feast later than normal that year. They were trying to restore the temple because the, the Greek um, authorities sacrificed pigs on the altar and desecrated it. So they tear it apart, lay it aside, build a new one, try to purify this temple. This Sukkot feast that they held became the core of what this Maccabean revolution was all about. Because they were able to overthrow this government, once again they think they're going to be able to establish this this Jewish nation under a Jewish king. They never get there. They only have the Maccabean priesthood at that point. They never established a king. The priests, again, were trying to get back to saying, God didn't establish a king at the beginning. It's by the priestly line. But at Sukkot, there's a few things that the text tells them to do. It's a seven-day feast, and it's structured around this this festival of where you get palm branches and wave them before God. And you sing the songs of David, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this becomes the focus of the Maccabean Revolution, so much so that the coins that they print have the palm branch on it. It's their don't tread on me flag. It's on their coins. It's on their, read in their documentation. And their war cry is Hoshana, God save us. Hoshana, Hoshana, Hosanna is their war cry. Rome comes to power in 63 BC, trying to squelch these uprisings all throughout Galilee and all throughout Judea. They outlaw palm branches in Jerusalem. 100 lashes to anybody that's found with a palm branch in Jerusalem. This zealot movement under the war cry of Hosanna, their banner, the palm branch, is squelched by this Roman Empire. Thousands are killed every Passover. The roads are lined with crucifixes. Jews dying as people were marching in for the festival. Passover becomes the focus point of when this Messiah is going to come. The priesthood had pretty much become Hellenistic after the Maccabean Revolution anyway. They were enjoying the wealth of the millions of people being able to flood back into Jerusalem. The Roman roads have really helped with this. The the Roman infrastructure allowed for people to travel all over the world. And thousands of miles, Jews would just flood into Jerusalem for the Passover feast. But because of this disagreement between Rome 
and this Messiah that's supposed to come at some point, they locked the eastern gate all year. You lock the gate, the Messiah can't come because it says he must come through the eastern gate. Only one day a year is the eastern gate opened. During this time, history tells us there was three revolts that happened on Passover. The first one, the Thragonus, a shepherd, gets this idea that he is going to be the king, crowns himself, marches into Jerusalem, becomes a priestly role, grabs some scribes, pours tar and oil over them, and lights them on fire. The first time in history we have the concept of a Roman candle. Shortly after this, Theodos, mentioned in Acts 5, grabs about 400 supporters, march on Jerusalem, promising his followers that if we march on Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, it will surrender. Roman government hears this and marches out to meet them, and they kill most of them and cut the guy's head off, march it back into Jerusalem. It's always a bloody time at Passover. Revolution. Another story also mentioned in the Bible was a Jew from Egypt. Out in the desert, he gathers 4,000 people. 4,000 people. Tells them that if we can stand on Mount of Olives and raise our hands and declare, the walls will fall down and we'll march in and take over Jerusalem. They do it. Rome marches out to meet them and Rome kills 400 and captures 200 more. He escapes out in the desert. It says that when they arrested Paul, he says, are you the Jew from Egypt? Eventually they catch him. Cut off his head. Put it in a cage outside of the gate. It was hanging there for years. Pilate, so disturbed with these uprisings, always would do a massive show of support. Josephus, the historian, writes about it, how he'd gather his legion and march from Caesarea over the pass into Jerusalem. Thousands of soldiers trying to squelch this massive influx of people that are happening every year. Traditionally, he would march on the Sunday before Passover, marching in under the banner of Rome. You as a disciple are thinking, is this another year? Will there be a revolt this year? What's Rome going to do this year? How are they going to squelch this? Three million people are, are just pouring in from all over the world to a city of a couple hundred thousand. The landscape's lined with tents and people and sheep. Josephus writes that often they would march into the city in silence just to not disturb Rome. Don't make a sudden move. Not too big of a group. Stick together. This time there's another procession. It's happening. In Exodus, the 10th day of the first month, it says, Go choose for yourself a lamb. And on the 14th day, kill it and eat it so it'll be enough for you and your family. If Jesus and his disciples have the Passover meal on Thursday evening, what was happening four days before this? Why were they entering into Jerusalem to begin with? It's lamb selection day. The disciples in Christ are entering into Jerusalem to, to select their lamb. I like to have this picture that Christ is marching into Jerusalem, surrounded not just by people, but by sheep. 456,000 lambs, if Josephus is correct, were killed that Passover. 456,000. With that being said, I want to read something to you. And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it, bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments on it, and he sat upon it. Pastor mentioned Zechariah prophesies that rejoice greatly, O people of Zion, shout in joy, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, full of a donkey. 
And as he rode along, most of the crowd spread their garments on the road, and others spread palm branches, which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build a wall against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You didn't recognize it. Why does Jesus cry? Is he crying because not everybody is yelling, Hosanna! Hosanna! Is he crying because his disciples are, in effect, yelling, Kill the Romans! Kill the Romans! Kill the Romans! If palm branches are outlawed in Jerusalem, where did they get them? I'm going to cut this just in case. I can bring that along. If you only knew what would bring you peace... There's a few things in this story, and I was reading a compilation of all four accounts. There's a few things in this story I want us to look at. Jesus cries twice in the text. I think he does this more than that, but it's recorded that he cries twice. But what makes God cry? Many of us hear this Christmas song no cry he makes away in a manger. That's not the case. The story begins in the first time where he's outside of Bethany and he hears that his friend Lazarus is, is laying sick. It says that he waits two days, he knows the story, and now hears that Lazarus is dead. It begins his walk to Bethany, it says that Miriam runs out to meet him, and he begins to talk with her and, and tell her, literally he tells her, Lazarus will be raised from the dead. Miriam, on hearing this, runs back to Mary and says, come out, the teacher has, has need of you to tell you. Mary rushes out, the people around her aren't sure what's going on, they're, they're sitting Shiva with her because Lazarus is dead, mourning this death of her brother. She runs out, they follow with him, he gets the Messiah, and she bows down before him. He tells us, Tells her that Lazarus will be raised. They head to the tomb. And as they're walking to the tomb, Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he says, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Say, da cruo. Dacruo. It means silent weeping. And there he stands, tears pouring down his face. Who's he crying for? Is he crying for Lazarus? Lazarus is in heaven. He says, No, when he sees their cries, he wept. So in touch with his friends, so moved by seeing his people that he loves under this anguish. He cries. The second time he cries, say Clio. Clio. We read it in the story. He sees the disciples and the people gathered around him as he's doing the triumphal entry, raising palm branches and crying, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. Blessed is he is who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. And he looks at the city and weeps, Clio. Sobbing out loud. It says, in inner anguish. And he wails. Why is he crying? There's one thing that, of all that I said this morning, you had to remember this is the one thing. Jesus cries for everyone. How does he cry for you? Does he weep because he sees you as a friend? 
feels your pain, knows the anguish that you are in, or does he sob out loud knowing that you misunderstood him? The second thing that I want you to, to grasp and make sure, have you picked your lamb? Have you selected your sacrifice? Today's the day. I would hate for you to leave this day not having selected a lamb. Those that have, has it been enough? And not just for you, you and your family. Because Christ wants to be your lamb. This sacrifice isn't just to appease an angry God. No, it's far bigger. Now his blood has been applied. The evil one has been conquered. Every time I come to Passover, this question runs through my mind. What does my Jesus look like? Is he flying under some banner, ready to conquer the oppressor? Am I shouting along with the zealots, kill them, kill them? As a church, as a body of global believers, so often we fall into this idea that the gospel is confess and believe so God can take you out of this evil world and take you to a better place. Come here to earth, kill all these people around us, purify it of evil, get rid of them all, pull me out of here. And I think Christ weeps. He says, if, I, if you just know what would bring you peace. Recently, I was reading books by a Jewish author, Eli Wazel. I think I've referenced him before. As a 16-year-old kid, he was hauled off to the concentration camps, him and his family. At the first point, his sisters and mother were taken away from him, and it was just him and his dad. And they first were to Auschwitz, um, and then to, to Monowitz. But as they were at Auschwitz, the, Roman, the, the Russian army was coming in to, to liberate Auschwitz, and the, and the Germans grabbed them and took them out before they could get there. He writes about Auschwitz. He says, the first, or never shall I forget that first night. It turned my life into one long night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Marching out of Auschwitz, him and his dad are trying to keep up because with the, with the Russians right behind them, they were just forcing these Jewish people to march as fast as they could. They knew that if you fell down or got left behind, you're dead. And him and his dad are struggling, trying to do this night march. And while he's walking, his dad stumbles and falls. And he says, I couldn't even look back because I knew it was going to happen. After the Holocaust, he writes, and I'm going to quote this, he says, if the Holocaust wasn't sufficient persecution for the Messiah to come, then when will God ever show up? We Christians have fallen into that exact same mentality over and over and over again. If only Christ would return, then God can defeat evil. But we, we get confused. The enemy wasn't the Nazis. The enemies aren't a political party or an opposition. It's the evil one. But Christ defeated him at his temptations. He bound him. When he casts out the demons, he bound him. When he conquers death, he bound him. We can take the evil one's territory. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to us. Go. Take it back. Is the evil one destroyed? Not yet. But he's bound. But if we continually wait for some violent moment where this king is going to ride in with his army and purify the world of evil, we miss it. The world needs a better gospel. One that in your pain, he gives you the strength to move forward. One where people look at you and go, that's different. That's not picketing and waving the palm branch. No, that's bending over and helping that homeless one, giving food to the poor and needy, visiting the homeless, going to the prisoner, looking at your child, putting your arms around them, seeing a world that is just going mad and saying there's a better way. Not a better slogan. Not a better party. And try to see this sacrifice. And try to join with this group yelling Hosanna, but it's not just declaring who the Messiah is. Everybody there knew he was the Messiah. Everybody there was waving the palm branch saying, this is the Messiah. They knew it. They weren't doubting if it was or not. 
That's not the point. Christ is saying, it's not if you're accepting me as the Messiah. I'm asking you to do something. The disciples marching in, we talked about it early on, marching into Jerusalem. Let's go up and die with him. Let's go, let's join, let's march into Jerusalem. Just think, we're going to move into the palace. We're going to have streets lined with gold. Sit on a cloud and play our harp. Christ saying, no, I need you to pick up your cross. It's not going to be easy. It's not. Those of you that have walked in the faith know it's not easy. But we have someone who looks at us and weeps with us and says, I will give you the strength. Take no thought for tomorrow. Daily, he gives us the strength just to, to take another step. I love the verses in Isaiah. It says, see, a king will reign in righteousness, and a ruler will rule with justice. And each one of us will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. If you want to change the world, be some shade. Be some living water. Fried shelter to somebody who needs it. I ask the question, what makes a God cry? And I ask it, how is God crying for you? Is he weeping, understanding your pain, recognizing the path of carrying the cross is not an easy one? Or is he wailing out loud saying, if you only knew what would bring you peace? Let's stand. God, on this Palm Sunday, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. God, coming to earth, paying, redeeming all of us. All have sinned, but all are justified if we accept your sacrifice. Help us to live it. It's one thing to shout Hosanna when you think you're taking over the, the empire. It's another thing to carry your cross. And as we go out of here, just help us to bring light to the world. Show them what God can truly do. It's not an easy one, but we know you'll be with us each step of the way. In Messiah's name, amen.